Welcome to Getting to Know the Bible. This is part two of the origin and history of the Bible. The New Testament was written in Greek. Its accuracy is also well supported by the manuscript evidence. In fact, there are thousands of surviving New Testament manuscripts from the first few centuries after Jesus. When compared with other ancient writings from the time of Jesus and before, the evidence for the New Testament is overwhelming. Professor F.F. F. Bruce has written, The evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors, the authenticity of which no one dreams of questioning. And if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. Other support for the reliability of the New Testament comes from early believers who quoted it. For example, Ignatius quoted from Matthew, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, James, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and 1 Peter. Others, such as Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement, Origen, and Tertullian, quoted from the New Testament thousands of times. These quotations can also be used to check the accuracy of the surviving manuscripts. Professor Bruce Metzger has written, Indeed, so extensive are these citations, that if all other sources of our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. There are several translations of parts of the Bible into English, dating back to the 7th century. However, English has changed so much that we would not be able to understand any of these. The first translation of the entire Bible into English was by John Wycliffe in 1382. Wycliffe did not translate from the Hebrew and Greek, but from a Latin edition of the Bible, known as the Vulgate. For the first time, the common people could hear the Bible in their own language. They quickly realized that the church leaders were astray from the Bible, in both what they taught and how they lived. Wycliffe and his followers met with great opposition from the church for their work, and many were killed. Forty years after Wycliffe died, his bones were dug up and burned, and the ashes thrown into a nearby river. This was meant to be a lesson for others who might attempt unauthorized translations. Wycliffe's Bible was handwritten in manuscript form. It took about ten months for each copy to be produced, and cost an educated man a year's salary. Of course, most people could not afford a copy themselves, but were thrilled to be able to hear it read by one of Wycliffe's followers. Wycliffe's Bible is one of the first to include chapters, but not verses. In the 1450s, the first printing press was developed by Gutenberg. It is difficult to overestimate the importance of printing for Bible believers. Suddenly, the Bible was widely available to be read by almost anyone who wanted to do so. In 1604, King James I convened a church conference which resolved that a translation be made of the whole Bible, as consultant as can be to the original Hebrew and Greek, and this to be set out and printed without any marginal notes and only to be used in all churches of England in time of divine service. In 1611, his resolution bore fruit in the most loved English Bible ever, the King James Version or Authorized Version, KJV or AV. It became the universally accepted version for the English-speaking world and remained so for 350 years. Towards the end of the 19th century, it was considered crucial to produce a new translation. Changes were needed for two reasons additional ancient manuscripts had come to light since 1611, and many English words had changed meaning so significantly as to cause confusion for the ordinary reader. As a result, in 1885 the Revised Version was published in the UK, and in 1901 the American Standard Version, based on the same texts. The 20th century has seen many new translations of the Bible. More than 80 new versions have been produced since 1948. These newer versions have the advantage of being based on more extensive manuscript evidence. The most widely used of these newer versions is the New International Version, NIV, first released in 1978. One difference between versions is the approach they take to translation. The three main approaches are 1. Formal equivalence, literal word for word. 2. Dynamic equivalence, thought for thought. And 3. Paraphrase some interpretation involved. A formally equivalent translation attempts to translate each word into an equivalent word in English. A dynamically equivalent translation attempts to translate each thought or phrase 
into an equivalent thought in English. A paraphrase contains the same ideas as the original, but doesn't follow the original text as closely. For example, consider the first three verses of Psalm 23. The NIV reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Living Bible reads, Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He lets me rest in the meadow grass and leads me beside the quiet streams. He restores my failing health. He helps me to do what honors him most. Paraphrases are popular for reading because they are designed to be easy to read and they can provide fresh insight into familiar passages. However, there is always a danger that the interpretations of the translator are wrong, and you have no way of finding this out for yourself. Paraphrases are not good for study purposes either. At first it might seem that the best approach is literal translation, since that is closest to the original text, but that is not necessarily the case. Consider these two examples. In Luke 18.13, a man beat his breast in remorse. In Chakwe, a Zambian language, this means to congratulate yourself, the opposite of what Jesus meant. Therefore, in the Chakwe Bible, the phrase, beat his breast, has been translated, beat his brow, which carries the idea of remorse. This is not a literal translation, but a thought-for-thought -thought translation. In the Philippines, repeating a word shows you are not sure. So when Jesus said, truly, truly, this would mean, I'm not sure of what I'm about to say, instead of, I really mean this and I want you to listen. Again, a literal translation is not the best. That's the end of session 3. Join us next time for Getting to Know the Bible Session 4, Reasons to Believe. Thank you.